and welcome to yet another exciting event uh, on 3D game engine programming and stuff. Um, in this session, we are going to look at smart pointers, weak pointers, and unique pointers. Oh my. And raw All pointers. The, and, well, raw pointers, I think we know about. Probably. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Um, so I have a presentation prepared for that, but I don't want to start that right away. What I want to look at first is um, what's called the uh, CPP core guidelines. Now, this is something I believe it's available on, uh, like it's a GitHub page or something like that. GitHub.io. Yeah, so it's like a GitHub page. And this was written by basically the, the authors of programming so yeah bjorn himself and herb stutter uh, bjorn Strup, if i pronounce that correctly um he's actually the uh well i would say he's the father of c plus plus right he kind of invented it at bell labs in like 1956 i don't know and herb stutter uh stutter sorry is the i think he's the on the chair of the c plus plus standards committee if I'm not mistaken, well, among other things, I mean. I mean, I sure hope so, since he's writing the standards. Well, he doesn't write it himself, right? So it's a whole team, but he's if a chairperson doesn't make decisions. They just organize the thing, right, and make sure everyone agrees on things. And if they have to make like the, be the last one to like break a tie or whatever like that, they can be they can do that. But I mean, he's well known in the programming industry, so. If they say it's correct, <laughs> I think they know what they're talking about. And what I want to uh, identify here is section R, which is on resource management. Um, uh, you should probably take a look at some of these things because then you can like understand what Thamperer is talking about half the time, maybe. Um, yeah. And <laughs> what Bani Batel, Batel, I don't know how to pronounce that one, uh, what he's complaining about most of the time. And what he's complaining about most of the time is um, everything that's stated in here, he, you know, he, he's against everything here. But <laughs> I, I think he just likes to uh, mix things up. But anyways, resource management. I'm just going to read a little bit of this. I'm going to talk about, uh, like, because this gives you some kind of context as to why uh, resource management uh, and why smart pointers exist in the first place. Okay, so I'm just going to re uh, read this. Let me just zoom it in, zoom it up a bit. Uh, for some reason, it, that breaks full screen, but okay. Um, now it's completely lost its place. All right. This section contains rules related to resources. A resource is anything that must be acquired and explicitly or implicitly. Uh, explicitly, of course, means like on purpose or implicit means like because of its behavior. Release such as memory, file handles, sockets, and locks. Uh, by locks, I mean mutex locks, I believe. Thread locks. The reason it must be released is typically that it can be in short supply. So even a delayed re release might do harm. The fundamental aim is to ensure that we don't leak any resources and that we don't hold a resource longer than we need to. An entity that is responsible for releasing a resource is called an owner, and therefore the term ownership. Um, okay, I'm going to read this part, but I don't completely think that this um, applies to game development because... Uh, this might only apply to applications that are run once, doing a, a specific task and end. Because when a process ends, it also releases all of its uh, resources back to the operating system. So this doesn't, I would not agree on this in a, in a context where game programming applies. There are a few cases where leaks can be acceptable or even optimal. And if you are writing a program that simply produces an output based on an input, and then the amount of memory needed is proportional to the size of the input, the optimal strategy for performance and ease of programming is something simply never to delete anything, or sometimes simply never to delete anything. Again, in games, it reminds me of someone. You have no yes, you have no idea how long your game is going to need to run. So. Never, never, never let memory leaks through because you'll just run out of memory and your game will crash. And that's just not a good experience for the end user. If you have enough memory to handle the largest input, leak away, but be sure to give a good error message if you are wrong. Here we ignore such cases. Okay, so it's there. I read it. 
I don't agree with it. Not for games. Don't let anything leak. Okay, so there's a few um, rules <clears throat> about resource management. I don't only, I'm only going to highlight, I think, the first couple because after afterwards they get a little bit esoteric. Um, so let's look at the first rule. If we can go there, yeah. So resource acquisition is initialization. This is referred to as RI. I think some people have been using these terms in the chat. And um, yeah, this resource acquisition is initialization. Means that um, when you allocate something, that even if an exception occurs, that it gets properly released or deallocated. Okay, so let's talk about what this, why we want, to, why this is important. Okay, to avoid leaks and the complexity of manual resource management, C++'s language enforced constructor destructure symmetry mirrors the symmetry inherent in resource acquire release function pairs, such as f open, f close. So these are the file open, file close pairs. Lock unlock, these are mutex locks, and the uh, new and delete uh, pairs. And whenever you deal with a resource that needs paired acquire release function calls, encapsulate that resource in an object that enforces pairing for you. Acquire the resource in its constructor and release it in its destructor. All right, so this is a bad example that doesn't use right, right? Okay, so we have a, and they're using string view because that's another one of the uh, uh, core guidelines. Uh, they're sending a raw pointer here, let's, uh, and it opens a port. Uh, whatever the return type of the port is, you know, automatically determined to compile time. It locks a mutex, does some stuff, sends the information through the port, and then unlocks the mutex. And then the port is closed. Now you can probably guess what could go wrong here. Um, but if you read a little bit further, you probably see it anyways. And then for some bizarre reason, the pass pointer to the send function is then deleted. Okay, whatever. I wouldn't have to do this because you don't know who owns this pointer, but okay. In this code, you have to remember to unlock, close port, and delete on all the paths, um, and do each exactly once. Further, if any of the code marked dot 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 throws an exception, then for example, X is leaked and my mutex remains locked, right? Because if this locks, uh, the port is opened, mutex is locked, and then something happens here, and before we could even send the data you know, across the network, boom, exception that gets thrown somewhere. Mutex was never unlocked. The port was never closed, which, you know, so this code never ran. And if you rely on X being deleted in this function for some bizarre reason, then X will leak. All right. So here we instead we use a unique pointer to X, um, passed by value, by the way. Okay, well, we'll look at unique pointer in a second. Uh, so now the function actually becomes the owner of the parameter x. Um, so port also ha implies ownership of whatever the destination. It could be an IP address or whatever. And we use a lock guard for the mutex. In this case, if anything happens here or an exception is thrown, port will ha will be well the destructor will be called on it. Lock guard's destructor will also be called, which in a, which forces the mutex to be unlocked if it's in a lock state, and uh, if this is successful and anything happens after that, it doesn't matter because X is a unique pointer, so it also implies ownership and it will correctly release whatever uh, X is pointing to. Okay, so this is right, right? Resource acquisition is initialization, so it doesn't require explicit unlocking, closing, and deleting because that happens implicitly. Now all resources cleanup is automatic, performed once on all paths, whether or not there is an exception. And as a bonus, the function now ad advertises that it takes ownership. Yeah, this is really important, right? Because if you have a function that, that you know you're passing a unique pointer by value, you're like, okay, I really get it. I have to send a, a pointer that will be destroyed in this function. Here, there's no such, right? It doesn't really say that this will be deleted inside this function. So this is really bad. Unique pointer implies ownership. Uh, well, okay, then to get into port. Okay, I don't want to really talk about that. Um, uh, in interfaces, use raw pointers to denote individual objects only. Okay, well, so what this means is, uh, in I assume in class interfaces, we can use raw pointers only uh, if we don't take ownership of those things. All right, so arrays are, for example, 
uh, best represented by a container, for example, vector, which is an owning as container, or a span, which is, maybe you haven't seen these yet, but a span is a non-owning uh, container, which basically just po uh, stores the pointer and the size of the array. Uh, such containers and views hold sufficient information uh, to do range checking, right? So this is bad. We've just passed up a raw pointer and the size n. Now, you may have seen also in the chat that Benny Benel was also um, touting a, a, a simple string class that all it does is it stores a pointer and a num the number of elements. Okay, so the, this is kind of, in a way, bad because you're also um, allowing anyone to change either parameter without any control of the internal variables or the internal state of the class. Mistakes have been made, and they will be made in the future, and memory leaks and unsafe code occurs. All right, so what's a better example? Oh, yeah, let's just look at this again. Okay, so the compiler does not read comments, so it can't read that this is the number of elements in P, and it doesn't even know that this that P is an, is an array. Uh, it could be just a pointer to a single integer. We don't know. Um, but it is safe to use a, the array operator on a pointer, by the way. I think we saw that in the pointer lecture. Um, but we don't know how many ele elements are, so we have no idea if n is greater than 2. So this could generate uh, like a bad subscript up or, uh, uh, out of bounds or whatever. So without reading the code, you do not know whether p really points to n elements. Instead, use a span. Uh, are we still in a resource one here? Yeah, r2. Um, uh, C style strings are an exception. Okay, I would not really use C style strings anymore, but okay. Uh, many current uses of pointers to single elements could be references. However, where null pointer is a possible value, a reference might not be a reasonable alternative. Okay, so what they're saying here, oh, sorry, I jumped something here. What they're saying here is that if it's valid that this is null, that meaning that it's not, you know, not an initialized value, or it just doesn't point to anything, if that's allowed, then you should still use raw pointers instead of a span, for example. Um, all right, actually, I think I'm just going to stop at this now because we're, I'm not really seeing a huge number of examples that really give us use cases for smart pointers. They're just telling us how, you know, resources should be handled properly. Uh, raw pointers are non-owning, so we always already established that just you can use raw pointers, but it just implies that nobody you know nobody has ownership of it or you cannot you cannot make any assumptions about ownership about it so okay don't delete raw pointers um all right so we, let's now look at smart pointers unique pointers and weak pointers and what they are and why we care but in any case it's good to know these we'll get maybe we'll get back to them to see a couple more examples like i do want to talk about these ones a bit uh, malloc free and new and delete why should we avoid these um, and that's, well, you know, going, goes along with these smart pointers. So let me just start this one. Presentation, slideshow, yeah. And of course it went to the wrong screen because I installed my NVIDIA driver, which reset everything. Okay. Right. So you guys see this? Yes. Yes. It yes. says... C++ for games, smart pointers. Just double check that the stream is correct. Bit cut off on the bottom because I want the my mini bar not showing up in the stream, but okay. Hi, and welcome to another lesson on C++ for games. In this lesson, you will learn about the different uh, smart pointers that C++ has to offer. So smart pointers is actually just a generic term, right? Uh, it just means pointers that are smart, like... Uh, this individual here you see on the right, obviously she's smart because she graduated her university degree and she's pointing, therefore she's a smart pointer. So <laughs> there are three types. Uh, actually, there are four, but don't use auto pointer anymore. I'm not even going to talk about it. But um, shared pointer implies, obviously, shared ownership. We'll talk about them in more details, of course. And uh, weak pointers implies a weak reference to an object that is managed by a short shared pointer. We'll get into that in a second as well. And unique pointer, which implies unique ownership. Um, yeah, so we'll first look at shared pointer because I think that's the most common use case. Uh, but yeah, let's be certain about that because you shouldn't just slap everything in a smart in a shared pointer and say, oh, done, memory management and no memory leaks. No. 
Uh, each pointer has its purpose and uh, don't abuse it uh, just because it's there. All right, so if you look inside the shared pointer class template, you will see that it's uh, um, that it stores more than just a pointer to the managed object. It also stores what's called a control block to keep track of the number of both strong and weak references to the pointed to object, right? Um, so we, we know that the weak pointer exists, but we don't know how to use them yet, but just know that this control block has both counts for both strong references or shared reference and the weak references. Um, right, and the shared pointer also stores what's called the deleter and the allocator for the managed object. Uh, the managed object is uh, destructed when the strong reference count goes to zero. So let me make this clear. It only means that the destructor is called on the object. The memory is not deleted or not deallocated until both the strong and the weak reference counts goes to zero. Well, why do you think that is? Why do you think that the pointed to object does not get deleted until both the strong ref counter and the weak ref counter go to zero? Why do you think that is? Anybody? You're like, oh, no way. I'm not speaking up. Maybe I lost everyone already. Cynic, why do you think that we cannot delete the memory until both the strong refs and the, and the weak refs go to zero? Because otherwise the weak refs will be pointing to inside of memory and other references as well, I guess. No. No, damn. No, because if you destruct it, I mean, there, of course, there shouldn't be any weak references, or there could be, but uh, but if you can, if you destruct it, it will also still, right? If you call the destructor on the object, it will also be an invalid object technically. So trying to call a function on an invalid object be bad, and you can't really access to be. And we'll see this in a second, but you can't actually access the object through a weak a weak reference. You always need to acquire a strong reference to it before you can destroy it. There's another reason. Anybody? Why the control block? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Why the object is not just not actually deleted until the ref counts go to zero? <clears throat> well, on the next slide, I'll give you the answer. Uh, but there's a hint. Uh, where do you think the control block that you see here that has these ref counts on them? Let me put my laser pointer on. Where do you think this control block structure is actually stored? Where is it stored? Like if you say, okay, well, obviously it's stored in memory, but I mean like, okay, what would be the best way to actually store the control block? That's kind of a hint. All right, let's take a look at the next slide here. So, this is one of the um, uh, CPP core guidelines, right? To avoid the new and delete in your code, you want to, uh, in your code, sorry, you want to use uh, you shared and weak pointers, right? So instead of using new and delete, you should prefer to use uh, std make shared, uh, which is a function template that allocates both, uh, listen, both the pointed to object and the control block in a single allocation. Does that make sense? So you're like, wh where's the control block stored? You can't store it in the STD shared point. You got to remember, this is literally shared. So every copy of an STD shared point object points to the same object and the same control block. They don't make copies of the control block. Even though you have shared ownership of the objects, the control block is also shared. So if the strong ref count went down to zero, and then you deleted it, and there's still a weak reference, and you try to, well, we'll see this in a second, you try to acquire a shared pointer of that, but the control block has been deleted. Chaos ensues. So you cannot delete the object or the control block until you know that there's no weak or no, sh no strong and no weak references to the original object. 
So std make sure there's a function. It will allocate both the actual object that you are uh, that you're creating and the control block. And that's uh, you know that's better for uh, memory. If you if you use new to create the raw object or a raw pointer to the object, and then create a shared pointer from that, that's entirely possible. You can do that, but that requires an additional allocation for the control block. So two allocations. But using make shared only requires a single allocation. Okay. <clears throat> but there's a problem with make shared, and we'll talk about that in a second. It's not possible to, to have an, a custom allocator. So for example, if you're using a game engine that has a like a memory pool or some kind of like you're like, okay, I wanna I wanna share reference count from this thing, but I wanna allocate from my custom memory allocator which is very common on console games or even on PC games doesn't, nowadays. Doesn't the standard template library allow you to define how they allocate things? Not if you use make shared. I, 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 I thought there was like an, a, an internal function or like a define that you could like do to define what to do when they are uh, Oh, like over, over, overwrite new and delete? Yeah, well, not new and delete, but I think that there's like somewhere deep down there's like a function that, you, that they give you that you can override yes you can override new and delete on a per class basis you can also override it globally that's possible but it's not really memory management it's not really a good way to well oh, for, no, for creating I, custom I, allocators it's like some some sort of define or something that like told SCD that there's like custom memory allocation going on, but I don't know. You you probably mean overriding global new and delete or like the, yeah, but I'm not entirely Maybe. sure. I'm not entirely sure. But in more useful use cases, I actually, you know, in a couple cases, I need to um, allocate memory align, in align memory. And with make shared, I can't specify alignment. So I'll need to use a custom allocator in order to uh, make that memory aligned properly for fastest access. So for that, I want to use a custom allocator, but SCD make shared doesn't allow you to provide a custom allocator or deallocator for your object. But in case you do need to provide a custom allocator, you can use SCD allocate shared instead, which I'll talk about in the next slide. I uh, know first I'm gonna talk about a custom deleter. So with, with uh, make shared, you can actually um, yeah, you can't, oh, yeah, sorry, I can't say. You also cannot have a, a custom deleter. So sometimes you only need to have a custom deleter, but not a custom allocator. And I've actually had to run in, I ran into this a couple of times uh, when I was doing my own frameworks. So SCD make sure it doesn't allow you to use uh, a custom deleter, but instead you have to use uh, the SCD shared pointer constructor, which takes a raw pointer uh, shown here on the bottom of the slide here. So here's our widget deleter, which just takes a, um, defines, a, well, this is called a function call operator, uh, which create, this is called a, a, a custom, no shit, a callable function object. Yeah, it's called a callable function object. So this operator allows it to become a callable function object. And the only thing that it needs to do is define uh, a pointer to the widget and somehow define some kind of custom deleter for this. But in order to use this custom deleter, you have to use new on the widget, unfortunately, which kind of breaks the whole point of make shared and provide the actual, an instance of the custom deleter. Now this is super cheap because obviously the deleter only has a function call operator and it doesn't actually define any member variables or anything like that. And we make it a struct just because we don't have to use private, public or anything to change the scope because by default, structs are public and classes are private. Okay, now you're like, oh my God, why do I need to know this? Well, at some point you will run into this and you're like, oh wait, um, I need to use a different deleter because the memory was allocated using malloc, for example, and I need to use free, but you know, a shared pointer's deleter, the default deleter for a shared pointer will always use delete, but it might not be possible or, you know, to use delete uh, directly on something that was allocated using the malloc function, for example. Or if you have a resource 
a pointer to a resource that was acquired through, um, uh, let's say, a third-party library, and that third-party library requires you to call um, like its own internal delete function. You still want shared ownership of that object, uh, but the third-party library doesn't doesn't give you a shared pointer. So you want to wrap that pointer in a shared pointer, and you want to delete it using the third-party library's custom release or delete, right? Could be. So, or if it's a com object, yeah, you don't want to delete it. You just want to call release and let the com object uh, ref counter handle it. So there's plenty of use cases for you having a custom deleter without necessarily needing a custom allocator. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at the custom allocator deleter. So if you need to alloc both allocate in a custom way and deallocate in a custom way, then you need a custom allocator. And the minimal custom allocator must be a, a template cat class. We talked about templates last week. And it must define the following things. So a type alias or type def, uh, prefer type alias in C++ 11 and higher, uh, for the template type called value type. It must have the name value type and must be the same value type as the template type. It's just a requirement. You got to put it in there. And it must have a no throw, no exception, uh, default constructor. So we mark that as no accept. And it shouldn't allocate anything. It should just be a default custom uh, constructor. It also has to have a no throw custom construct, uh, copy constructor that can be constructed from a convertible type U. So here we can supply another template argument on the actual uh, constructor, which can take U and U must be convertible to T. Okay, that being said, that's what this means. But anyways, and it must have an allocate method that takes a parameter N uh, and that defines the number of elements of type T to allocate memory for. Uh, as you can see, we're going to use uh, we're not going to use the array operator because if we do, we have to also use the array deleter. But we're not doing that because we don't know what n is. So we just allocate the, a chunk of memory that can be used to store n elements. So you might have yeah, if you know the difference between al uh, array allocating a new array of elements or just a block of memory that's this size then uh, there's a difference. All right, it must also have a no throw, no except, no throw uh, deallocate method that takes a, the pointer to, to be deleted and the number of elements to deallocate. And it has to have a no throw, again, no except, uh, equality operator and a uh, inequality operator that operate on types T and U. So here we can, custom, uh, we can uh, define an uh, quality operator for two different allocators of type T and U. And in which case, it, yeah, this one can just always return true. And this one can always return the opposite of whatever this returns. OK, I hope that makes sense. So this is the minimum allocator deallocator that you need to have in order to use with allocate shared. So let's see an example of using it. Uh, very simply, if this is our custom allocator definition, within the custom allocator defined on the previous slide, we can use it with STD uh, allocate shared. And what this does will allocate the uh, 10 widgets, or we turn a shared pointer to 10 widgets using the custom allocator. And also the control block for that block of memory will be stored with that shared pointer, if that makes sense. So yeah, you might like, oh, when am I ever going to use this? Well, maybe not in first year, maybe not in second year, but someday you might come across code like this and you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember three, four years ago when Jeremiah talked about custom allocator deallocator for allocating shared pointers. Yeah, that was what I, did, what I was doing. Okay, so another thing you probably didn't know about, even if you thought you knew about shared pointers, is that sometimes you will need to get a shared pointer from the instance of the object you're calling a function on or uh, for example if you're creating a scene graph sometimes you want to give the uh, child node a shared pointer to the parent node so the parent is actually going to pass the shared pointer to itself 
when you add a child node from the scene graph to it. So in order for the parent to actually get a shared pointer from itself, you have to derive from std enable shared from this, which is quite verbose, uh, and the type is, this is the curiously recurring template pattern. It's a template, you know, the base class is actually a template of the class itself. Yeah, meta <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I don't wouldn't say this is technically meta programming because we're not we're not executing or um, we're not doing any compile time compilation, right? It's this is just a curiously recurring template pattern, a reoccurring or recursive template it's, pattern. It, it's coming close enough for me. <laughs> okay, let's call it meta programming then, just for cynic, but. <laughs> In the end, it doesn't actually do any like uh, compile time uh, evaluation of code. Not really, but okay. Um, there was only a rest one restriction, of course, uh, is that the actual object, like the widget, has to originally have been generated or stored as a shared pointer or created using make shared or allocate shared. All right, so you cannot use shared from this unless this thing is already a shared pointer. I know that's a bit confusing and weird. <clears throat> yep. So, uh, if a function in which, uh, oh, right, 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 right. Okay. So there's a few restrictions on this one. For example, if the function, for example, this is a const function, which, which means that the internal pointer is a const pointer, then you can only return a, a shared pointer to a const widget, right? And this is the non-const version. So the non-const version of you know, this one can return a non-const pointer, well, it's a shared pointer to a non-const yeah. widget, if that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I don't even know if I want to share this with you. But I'm going to put some code in the... Let's see if I can select this. I can't really select it. But okay, um, let me see if I can put some code into the chat. Right, if you have a object that does not derive from shared from this, let's call this shared struct bad, and then we have a function that says uh, returns a shared pointer, shared pointer to bad get pointer, and then it does something like this. Okay, indentation might not be perfect, but whatever. Return std shared pointer bad <laughs> this like you might be tempted to do something like this or to create something in a shared pointer that was never created as a shared pointer in the first place this is about the worst thing you can possibly do i just pasted some code into chat i know the stream doesn't really show up very well in the stream how to get it in there i don't know uh, but anyways, uh, you can see that I'm returning a shared, uh, a shared pointer by simply wrapping the in the functions this pointer in a shared pointer. That's like the worst thing you can do. But okay, it will <laughs> like the result in that object being deleted multiple times <clears throat> um, when we create multiple shared pointers to the same raw pointer. Oh, and apparently, uh, as of C++ 17, if you really just need a weak pointer to an object, like in the case where I pass a, uh, a child node in a scene graph, a pointer to myself, you, re you generally don't want to use a shared pointer or because that implies that the child owns the parent and it should be the other way around. Uh, C++ 17 also introduces uh, weak from this. I think it's enable weak from this. So just like this, but you can have actually all allocate it as a weak pointer instead of a shared pointer or get a weak pointer to it. I hope that makes sense. Okay, just a few more slides, guys, and then we'll take a look at some examples. Um, yeah, dynamic casting, shared cast, uh, point, uh, sorry, static casting and dynamic casting uh, using SED dynamic cast or static cast are not safe on shared pointers. You should use uh, SED static pointer cast and SED dynamic pointer cast or SED const pointer cast when dealing with shared pointers or God forbid, reinterpret pointer, pointer cast. So here shows an example. We have a base class, which minimally needs a virtual destructor to be uh, to be dynamic castable. And we have a shared pointer to the base type. 
and uh, we have a derived type so the derive derives from base obviously and we make uh this a shared pointer using make shared and to, we can always okay so what we call upcasting and downcasting is usually the way we draw them in a class diagram uh, so let me open up my whiteboard for a second here always looking for a reason to use my 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 pen because now i have a drawing pen let's create a new board and move it over here so usually when we talk about uh let's go black we have at the top, we have the base class. Oh, it's using arrows. I didn't want arrow. Let me turn that off. No arrowheads. Okay, um, ignore those. <laughs> but now I do want an arrow. Um, so this is base, and then we have derived. Right. So it always points up. Then the base types are at the top, and this one derives from from base. And so when we have this, we, we say that if we want to go from derived to base, this is called an upcast. But when we go to, from base down to derived, this is called a downcast. This is so readable. Is it? <laughs> no. Are you kidding? Up. You think I have beautiful handwriting? Upcast. Is that better? It actually is, but yeah, it's fine. You explain it, right? So, okay, so that's why we we say upcasting, downcasting. Now, of course, when we want to take derived and we want to upcast it to base, we don't need this is not dynamic. So, not uh, here. Let me put that in in red, and we will also get rid of the arrowheads there. Um, so, this is not dynamic. Right, because the compiler can tell at compile time that derived is derived from base. But what we can't tell, get rid of that arrowhead. Why are there all the arrowheads on it? This is called a dynamic cast. Because at compile time, we can't tell if we have a base pointer. We cannot tell if it was actually allocated as an object of type derived. So that, that's why we need to dynamic. So this is a runtime cast. And this one is a compile time. It can be checked at compile time whether the cast will work. Does that make sense? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, totally, dude. I totally get that. All right. So this same thing here, right? So... Uh, we have a pointer of type derived, and when we want to go up, well, we don't need a dynamic cast because we can check at compile time whether this is going to work, and indeed we know it does. Uh, and a downcast, however, does require it because we could have more than just derived being derived from base. We could have many different types, and we need to check at, at runtime which type it actually is. But for smart pointers, you know, the, the lesson is here. For smart pointers, you use the static pointer cast and dynamic pointer cast when dealing with smart pointers. Okay, that's all I want to say about smart point or shared pointers. And now we will talk about the weak pointer. And a weak pointer is used to break, basically break the circular references that might occur. Now, I gave you kind of an example on the previous slide about class. Oh, no, I didn't really. Um, but I was talking about the, the scene graph, for example. You have a, a root node, and then that node might have children, and you know, all the children like store maybe you have more children and whatever. And it's the, the, the one that owns it is called the parent and whatever. So in this case, we definitely don't want the, the child node storing strong references back to their parents because they will create a circular reference. So let me go back to the whiteboard and uh, try to um try to describe that a bit more better okay oh i don't want to do that okay you're like oh he doesn't even know how to scroll this should be able to scroll this there should be a way to do this here we go <laughs> space bar okay so let's say we have in this case i'm going to use circles because they're not classes anymore we have the root node oh no i'm using the mouse to do why would i do that i've got a pen Ru black hello 
still red. Okay, root node. And then it might have, uh, I'm an artist, I'm an artist. It might have a, a child node in the scene graph, and that could have also many children. Uh, child, child, child. We'll just call them C for now. And they might have pointers back to their parents. So you can easily traverse up and down the scene graph. Um, this is also called the parent. Right, so that's child the parent. And if we had, for example, I'll mark the strong references as green. Uh, it's okay for the parents to have strong references to their children, but if we had a strong reference back to the parent and we deleted the root node, right? We delete this guy, then this reference should go to zero, which would cause that node to get deleted, technically should. But if the children own a strong reference back, the ref counter doesn't go to zero. No, no, no. It goes to one. So now you have created a dangling resource and therefore a memory leak because there's no way to get this pointer address out of space. So out of outer space. So you, you basically created a memory leak. So to solve this, to fix this, the red all have to be weak. The green all have to be strong, 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 but the red uh, red pointer should be all weak references back to the parent. That way, if you delete this, this should be a, a strong. Right? If you delete this, the ref the strong reference goes to zero. Then that gets deleted, and all the uh, this one goes to zero as well. So that one gets deleted, and that one gets deleted, and that one gets deleted safely, and no circular references. So. Here is an example on the slide, which I will go back to. I still have to format this one a bit better. Should be still on the laser pointer. Should be on the laser pointer. Oh my gosh, I suck. All right. So here we see a weak pointer to a widget, and we have a strong pointer, right? So this is the ref counter one. And we just we can just assign the strong pointer to the weak pointer like this. So we can only construct a weak pointer from a shared pointer. We cannot create weak pointers without a shared pointer. In order to get a shared pointer from a weak pointer, because you, like I said before, you cannot actually access the weak pointer directly, uh, sorry, the pointed to object directly from the weak pointer, you must lock it. And when you call lock on a weak pointer, you get back the shared pointer. So if this share pointer is a valid pointer, then it is, then you are able to use it. If, for example, lock fails, and it will fail when all of the strong references to the shared pointer have gone to zero, but remember it's only destructed and not deleted, so we can still count the references. But if this gets back an, an invalid pointer, then we shouldn't use it. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's in a nutshell. Weak pointers. They're used to the primary reason is to break circular references. And a, a unique pointer is obviously one that has single unique ownership, and you should not combine. Right, you don't create, don't get a raw pointer to a unique pointer and create a shared pointer from it, because you'll end up with double deletion problem again. And this is the most common way of implementing or using what I called before, RI or resource acquisition is initialization. And if you've heard of this before, uh, this also allows for what's called the pimple idiom. And I'll give you an example of this in the next slide. It's mostly, uh, mostly used to hide implementation details uh, and for cross-platform development, you use the, the pimple idiom. It's a design pattern. But anyways, um, right, as usual, there are several references on cppreference.com if you want to know more. Um, yeah, I, I don't know any good books that talk about this. It's just, you just read the references. I know it's like terribly, terribly boring to read that, but, or look at some examples. So at this point, are there any questions about this?
Okay, no questions. Then let's take a look, look at a quick example. I say quick, but I know it's really not quick uh, because I always go into too much detail. So for this, we'll create a new project. Let me just do that here off screen. New project, I'm just gonna use um, an empty project. I, I, I usually don't wanna, even if I don't wanna start with a console even. I just want an empty project and we'll call this smart pointers. My favorite folder. It's going to the other window, but I'll move it over in a second. Okay. So now that we have some kind of a test project, let's create a new, not a new class. We just want a new source file. Main, obviously, what else? And we'll make sure it works with return zero. I know it's not required, but hey, just wanna make sure my project is set up, it compiles, it runs, it's amazing. Okay, so far. You guys still with me? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at something. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here. All right, so let's say we have this uh, this widget class. I'm going to write the widget class out here. Widget class is very simple. It... I won't make separate classes or header files. That's just, you know, whatever. Class widget, super simple class. It's got a public constructor, a widget um, that takes some kind of data, which we'll initialize to zero. Initially, make this explicit so we don't, I don't know if I talked about this before with you guys. Oh, come on. But if you have a constructor which takes a single parameter, it's often um, not intentional to allow the widget class to be constructed from that single parameter type. So in order to prevent that mistake from happening, uh, always uh, use the explicit keyword on that constructor. So that means you, if you, you know, you can't assign an integer to it and accidentally create a widget. I showed some examples of how that could happen in a previous session and we're going to use m data for the actual data let's construct it then m data data okay and um well a destructor very simple and uh maybe i'll do no i'll just say default for now because i don't care about the output of it Okay, so that's our minimally minimal class. And now we want to create, oh, I don't have to delete that, a shared pointer to it. So for that, we need memory, memory, memory. Shared pointer, weak pointer, and unique pointer are all in the memory header file. Same with make shared and uh, allocate shared, they're all there. And to create a shared pointer to it, we can always use auto for, you know, less typing. Make shared, and this is a, a function template. So we got to specify the type. And in this case, we only supply as the parameter, the parameters to the constructor as the only parameter to the make shared function. We could also leave this blank and this will call the overloaded version of this, which is to take no parameters and initialize data to zero. So those both work. In this case, we will explicitly initialize the constructor parameter to three. All right, so now we have a shared pointer and you'll notice that we don't actually need to delete it explicitly. Um, I'm not gonna leave this blank because I wanna put a breakpoint in here just to show you that it's working and I'll also add some IO stream just to have something to print out. I will just say widget. Watch it. Okay, so if we put a breakpoint here, um, first, well, actually, 
do this because I want to show you the differences, right? So if we had a raw pointer, right, but then we'd have to do this. So that's the equivalent raw version. And if we do this, will the const at the, just this, and we'll just allocate it and then return zero, will the destructor on the widget be called? I don't, I'm not looking at chat or anything, so if you have an idea about it, just say it. Will the destructor will the destructor be called or not? No. No. Who thinks it will be? Cynic. Cynic's off playing video games already. Just kidding. Dammy. Do you agree that the destructor will not be called? It shouldn't get called, right? No. Yeah. So if it does get called, this breakpoint should be hit. Um, for some reason, it didn't even, it didn't, didn't even, didn't didn't even generate the. No. Yeah. I can't even put a breakpoint on there because it's. Because it's not being used, it's like um, you're not even I'm, I'm, I mean, ever if calling you're it. Very if you're very intrinsic about it, it technically does get called when the main function ends, right? And when Windows no. cleans data. No, 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 no. Oh no, actually, it doesn't. No, call it no. So just the the destructor will it. will not be called. Um, so actually, the because that that code wasn't even compiled, it didn't it <laughs> moved the breakpoint down there. So let's just step over, anyways. Uh, so I was wondering what happened, but it actually was just a little bit further. Uh, it hasn't actually allocated anything yet, so here it allocates it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a big tip off that, like, I can't even like look at where my cursor is. It's on line 14. I can't even put the breakpoint there because there's there's nothing in the generated code that points to that line. But okay. Um, so no, clearly. But if you say, will the memory, will this memory be cleaned up? Yeah. Like I said, when the processes go out of, you know, get removed from the kernel, whatever, any memory that was allocated within that process will be returned to, to the free store, to the heap. But the destructor will never be called. No. That's right, yeah. It, it just marks memory as inactive or something. Yeah, just, you know, returns it back to the free store, whatever. Every processor has some kind of virtual space, and that just, that's virtual space just goes back to, you know, the system. So in order to ensure that things get cleaned up properly, even if we forget to delete them, then we use shared pointers. If I can mouse over on this, I think, can you see this? It becomes a SAD shared pointer. But uh, anyways, yeah, you should know that by looking at this. So now I'm going to run the code here again. I'll put a breakpoint here as well. Recompile. Run it. <clears throat> so now we hit the first uh, sh uh, this line where it's going to allocate. So it allocates, and then it's going to actually return. And then after the return, it's going to this is going to go out of scope, and then it's going to call delete, and we're going to actually get cleaned up. So any resources that were allocated by the widget will also have a chance to get cleaned up as well, if necessary, or any of its you know dynamic resources should also be stored into either unique pointers or shared pointers. So then they also automatically get cleaned up. In most most cases nowadays, you can actually safely ignore destructors unless you really have to do something explicit when destroying them, like release open gel resources, for example. Okay, so that that's kind of the shared pointer part of it. Um, we haven't used weak pointers or anything like that. Uh, what else do we got? Uh, yeah, we've got a sample for this already. All right, so let's take a look at the weak pointer. So here, if we have a uh, shared pointer, what I'll do is I'll just wrap this up in a scope block. Uh, come on. Let's get rid of this. Can't see it because it's not formatting correctly. Get rid of that. So what happens here is that because I put these curly braces in here, I actually create scope. And at the end of the scope on line 25, right, this will 
go out of scope. So I'm going to create a, a weak pointer up here. Weak pointer to a widget. Uh, and just call it P widget, I guess. We don't initialize it to anything until we've actually have a shared object of it. So then P widget can be equal to the shared widget. And then we basically yeah, go out of scope. And then in order to use the weak pointer, we have to create another one, another shared pointer. And to do that, we have to use the weak pointers lock method. Let's just add a function to this so we have something to call. And just output something. Just to see if the function gets called. Put a breakpoint on that. All right, so in this case, um, we can then call the function if we have a shared object or shared pointer to it. And my question to you now is in this case, will widget do something be printed to the console or will this breakpoint be hit? In this case. You guys are a lively bunch today, aren't you? <laughs> Will this function get called? Is it safe to call this function on the uh, on this object? Anyone? Bueller? I don't think so. You don't think it's safe or you don't think it will get called? Don't think it will get called. Does anybody want to argue that? No, you guys already dropped off. Okay, that's cool. Um, <laughs> anyways, all right. So this is the shared object here, but since we don't have this shared object within outside the scope of these brackets here, then the strong ref count will go to zero, but the weak weak ref count will be one because we have a weak reference here. We copied it there, and then we try to use it here to get another shared pointer there. This does not point to the same that of that widget because these are in completely different scopes. So keep that in mind. Um, the answer is no, the function will not be called. And the reason being because we cannot acquire a strong reference to it because the strong ref count is zero. All right, so let's just see. I'll, I don't know if I can, yeah. Should be able to show the output and have it showing the console output, but SDDC out does not see out to the Visual Studio console. There is a way to do that, but uh, it's a bit more involved. Um, all right, so here we just allocate a widget, uh, a weak reference to a widget, but that's not actually allocating a widget. Uh, then we call make shared to actually construct a widget and store it in a shared pointer or a strong ref counted pointer. And then we copy the strong ref to a weak ref. Now, oh, okay, you can see already that the breakpoint on the destructor already got called because, like I said, the destructor is called when the when the strong reference go to zero, but the memory is not deleted until the weak references also go to zero. But okay, we can't see that. Now we try to lock it using the weak reference, and if you if I even mouse over on this, you see that the internal control block. Um, let's see if we can see what the values are. Uh, these are the strong references. This is a Microsoft Visual Studio implementation because generally this is internal implementation details. And the weak refs are one. But because we don't have any strong ref counts, it's zero, we won't be able to acquire a lock on it and the resulting widget will be empty or basically a null strong, uh, shared pointer. And since this is failing, then we don't call do something on it and we can get, you know, safely make sure that we don't actually call a function on a deleted object. <clears throat> okay, so that's weak, uh, weak pointers. Any, any questions about that? No, no, I stopped listening half an hour ago. 
Okay. Um, custom deleter, right? So sometimes you, like I mentioned, you might get a, a pointer to an object from a third party library and you want to use it as a shared pointer. Well, that's possible. All we need to do is to find a custom deleter for the object. Let's assume that the widgets are being constructed from, I don't know, some third party library, whatever. But when it goes out of scope, we can either delete it, release it, or, you know, use decrement ref count. I don't know, whatever method the third party library requires for you to indicate that it's, that it should be, you know, thrown away. Uh, so we can uh, use a custom deleter, which again, just has a single callable function object, which is defined by operator and just brackets with the actual parameters being a pointer to the thing that we want to delete. And then, um, then in this case, we can no longer use make shared because make shared doesn't allow us to pass a custom deleter to it. So in this case, we have to use, um, is this going to work? Yeah, I think so. Um, shared pointer to a widget. And now we have to say explicitly new widget three, and we use the custom deleter, custom widget deleter. What did I call it? Widget deleter. And we pass that as the second argument to our shared pointer constructor. And this just instantiates an object. So we're passing an instance of the widget deleter to shared pointer. Now, when that shared pointer goes out of scope, it should call the custom deleters method when this widget goes out of scope. So I will put that there, remove these because I don't care about these anymore. And I'll run this. And then when the program exit, you see it calls the widget deleters function call operator, which allows us to use a custom deleter on this shared object. So this is actually needed in more places than you'd expect. Like I mentioned, allocating things to third party libraries that have a unique or custom way of removing or you know deleting them, then you can still use use them as shared objects. All right. Any questions about that? Like you lost me at hello. Okay. No, no, no. I just don't have questions. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Everything makes sense you. though. Okay, I'll spare your brains by uh, skipping the part about the custom allocator, and I'll just show. Let's see, the unique pointers. I mean, in this use case, it's kind of like hard to show the difference, right? Because we just have unique pointers. And they look, right now, they look the same unique widget. And we should also use make unique because since we have make shared, we also have make unique. But there's nothing special about make unique. And in fact, I think if we look, we look at the implementation of this for... Um, Whatever. I mean, it's just, like, look, it's just calling, well, you can see this. I mean, this is the the type of the thing we're creating. That's the widget. These are all the arguments we're passing to the constructor. And it's literally just calling new on it and passing back a unique pointer. Make shared is slightly more complex. If we look at make shared's implementation, it's going to be doing a lot more. Um, because it needs to also allocate the control block. So it's not just this, it will be a little bit more about, um, yeah, some more stuff that it needs to do in order to keep, to get the bookkeeping in the same allocation block as the object itself. And 
adhere to alignment requirements and allocators or whatever else that needs to be done on it, but make sure it doesn't allow you to use allocators. But you know what I mean. So make unique doesn't really do anything special other than exactly this unique pointer uh, widget new widget three that's it these two lines are identical but you see the green lines is like it's can it's like it can be replaced with make unique okay for the sake of consistency if i just allow my <laughs> resharper to fix that it will just replace it with make unique because this is more consistent with make shared and adhering to the cpp core guidelines where you should prefer make shared and make unique uh, and never use new and delete explicitly. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So one thing I do want to point out about this is that I can, for example, say widget. This is a second widget. I can do this, right? This is fine. I now have two objects, which points to the, yeah, there's gonna be a hint about this because yeah, I'm not using it and it's just gonna to point to the same object, so whatever. But I know what I'm doing. Now this, this is fine. These two objects can both point to the same underlying pointer and the shared reference count will go up and it won't get deleted until both widget and W2 are out of scope. Unfortunately, with unique pointers, well, not unfortunately, because this is by design, of course, we cannot have two. That's why it's called unique. So if I try to make a unique widget two, which also points to unique widget, well, this is absolutely not allowed. This will not compile, right? Uh, you can't, you're trying to, and you'll get this wacky area, you're like attempting to use a deleted function the function was explicitly deleted and you know you're a new programmer so you're like what why the heck would anybody delete the assignment operator or something <laughs> well obviously because this would break the unique ownership semantics so how can you pass around unique pointers you're wondering well, what's the point? How can I pass this as a function or return value? Well, you cannot. You cannot. The only way you can you can actually do this is by moving it. And we talked about move semantics last week as well. So moving a unique pointer to another, this is also this is perfectly fine. But let's take a look at what happens here. Let's get rid of this one. Let's run this again. Um, so now we are here at the make unique. F10, and now we see that the unique pointer contains uh, valid da data, M data equals three. And now we, we want to move that one into a new unique pointer while well, we can. But the original becomes empty. Do you guys see that? The first one becomes empty, so now this isn't pointing to anything. And now unique widget two takes ownership of the underlying object that it's pointing to. Is it and pointing to invalid data or is it pointing to a null pointer? A uh, unique widget is basically null pointer and unique widget two points to valid data. Okay. Yeah. So it, it changes what it points to then. Yeah. 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 Well, I, uh, last Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever it was, I showed you an example of move value semantics. And I showed you that, for example, with an array, we had an example of an array or a string or something like that. We just copy the pointer over to the new object where we, well, we're moving it to, and we set both the pointer of the original object and the capacity. Remember, you're like, why do we set the capacity to zero? Because it is more correct. So the internal object of the unique pointer will be set to null. It will not be left as a dangling pointer or something like that. The point is that in order to uh, you know make make sure we adhere to these unique ownership semantics, we can't make copies of unique pointers, but we certainly can move them. So yeah. if I need, no. <clears throat> so let's say we have a function that says do something. 
and we need to pass it a unique pointer for some reason. Well, you'll see in the core guidelines, this is not recommended either, but let's say we did. Um, yeah, we, we should actually check, right? Because similar to raw pointers, weak pointers can also be empty, but we can just check if w, so if w is valid pointer, then we can actually do something on it. And weak pointers and shared pointers, both, uh, you're, they're both going to be used as if they were a pointer. So not a reference, but a pointer. And then we, we use the pointer dereference to get to the underlying object, and then we can call a function on it. Yeah. Okay, but in order uh, to call... Yeah, I, I, was, I, I was just curious, since, you know, they're technically pointers, so, like, if you had to set them yourself... Mm -hmm. So this doesn't work, right? So why doesn't why doesn't this work? Why can't I call do something with the unique widget two? Because you need to move it. Because I need to move it. But if I don't want this function to take ownership of the weak pointer, because if I moved it, I can do something on it. But I, by the time it gets out of the function, it's gone. So what should I do here to make sure I can actually call this? without actually transferring ownership into it. There's a couple ways I can fix this. I take in a different own, uh, pointer type in the function. Here? Yeah. A different pointer type? Can you be more specific? Uh, well, I would do a raw pointer, but that might be. Yeah. That's one way. Oops. And. Well, do something is not const, but it doesn't change the class. So let's keep it const okay. so that we can actually call this with a const a const pointer. We still need to check for validity because now it's a raw yep. pointer. So we still got to make sure that it's not null before we actually try to do something with it. But yeah, this works. What's another way I could fix this? I mean, I can't do that could now because that's no longer a unique pointer. Could you take a reference to the unique pointer? Does that work? Mm -hmm. Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah. So okay, but I need that, to do something to this. To, let's just continue with this example for now. I need to fix this. Oh. So what do I need to do to fix this now? Probably get. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So dot get allows you to get a raw pointer to the underlying object, right? So the thing that the unique pointer is storing a pointer to. So you can use get to get the raw pointer. That is safe, as long as we agree that if we have a raw pointer, we cannot assume ownership of it then this is perfectly fine. The that's, own, the, that's how it's defined, right? The raw pointer stones have ownership? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's core guidelines, right? But, you know, um, a lot of people in their frameworks, they'll, they'll mix raw and unique pointers and they don't, they don't, you know, understand the ownership rules. So yeah, they'll yeah, be going around, you know, explicitly deleting raw pointers and then using unique pointers or shared pointers and half the code. And it's like, what? Come on, one or the other, not both. Stop confusing the hell out of everyone. Because then you don't know, like, how do we imply ownership here, right? Do we use raw pointers? If we do, then how do we know who's the, who's the owner? If we use uh, shared pointers, unique pointers, there's no ambiguity. It's clear what they are. And if you say, well, raw pointers, we can use them, it's fine, but we'll never assume ownership of a raw pointer. Okay, then that's agreed. All right, the other way we can solve this is by passing a reference, of course. Yeah. We can also dereference the object like this if we know that it's a valid pointer uh, pass by and the then way, yeah. change, change this to pass by reference. And then we don't need to check. We can just call the object directly. So that's another way. But before we can dereference it, we must make sure that the actual pointer is valid. Right? So then we have to do it outside here if unique widget to only then can we actually call the object with dereferencing. Yeah. So then we put the owner, the, you know, the check outside the function. Hmm. That's a bit annoying. So I don't really want to do that. So another way we can do this safely without transferring ownership is by passing a 
reference to the unique pointer. So like this, then we have to do our check again. Inside yeah, that, the that was actually what I meant with passing reference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that would have been your your second guess. I just want to show the 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 different ways that we could solve this, yeah. right? But obviously the um, the preferred way is to probably pass by const raw pointer. Actually, because if we have a, a function like this, then we impose a requirement that this function only works with unique pointers. But yeah. it might so not be a bad thing. There are situations where that's like a valid thing to do then, right? Uh, if about... You, if you want to make sure that the function only gets called by an owning object, you could do that. Referred. Right, um, but uh, this is preferred if the object is required to exist. And this one, no, I didn't spell something right. I think I have a typo there, so T H I N N G U S. Preferred if the object is not required. Right? So having a null pointer here is fine, but always check before you use it. Always check in the function. Yeah? So if you're like, okay, no, this function does not, should never be called with an invalid object, reference. If you want to allow this thing to be called with an invalid, so null object, it's optional. In fact, I would even default it to be a null object. Right? I mean, it's, there's some cases where some of the parameters are, you know, not absolutely required. In that case, just, you know, allow it to be passed by pointer and initialize it by default to null. This is not required. Okay. Shared pointers, weak pointers, unique pointers. Am I missing anything else? Oh, uh, casting. I think we kind of got casting or not. Static pointer cast, dynamic pointer cast. You, you talked about it. I talked about it. Do you want me to show a concrete example? I think it's not needed. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't know about the rest. I don't need it. <laughs> Anybody else want to see an example of dynamic casting, static casting yeah. of pointer types? Would be All right. Nice. So in this example, we have base class. We'll just call it base. And although it's a struct, it's still a class. The only difference between structs and classes, as I, as I mentioned before, is that by default, the... Um, Everything is public in a struct. Right, this is required for dynamic cast. Minimal requirement, right? So if we want to have a base class that has a V table, virtual table, that can be dynamically casted, or if you have at least one virtual function, then always, always have a virtual destructor if you don't do anything because the the destructor of the base class determines the destructor of all of the, of the other types especially if you hold a pointer to the base type yeah you definitely should make this destructor virtual and then we have a struct called derived so this is a in our little class diagram here oh come on yeah that's right so base and then we have a derived class which derives from base and even our struct types are always public but that's why it's grayed out it's like um, this is redundant because hey that's a struct so you really don't need to specify public 
And we have a function here called, um, what was my example? Yeah, actually didn't specify nothing, but anyways, you could have functions in here. And then if we had a shared pointer of the base type, let's just call it B for now, you can actually do this. I think actually, can you do this? Derived? Yeah, that's perfectly valid. So we have a shared pointer to the base type, but the actual uh, concrete type is derived. And then if I wanted to, later in the code somewhere else, I wanted to actually get the derived type out of that, I can use dynamic, like it's already telling me, dynamic pointer cast of dynamic, oh shit, derived, sorry, on the base type. This should work. Well, because it's a shared pointer, we still need to check if it's valid. D is valid. So if we were using, um, on the other hand, if we had like a raw pointers, this works the exact same way, right? So we have a pointer to B, new base. No constructor, no, uh, no primers. Oh, sorry, new, that should be derived. We can store the uh, derived object in a pointer to the base type, that's perfectly allowed. And then if we needed a derived pointer out of it, we definitely need to use a dynamic, not dynamic pointer cast, just dynamic cast because it's not a shared pointer anymore. We're now using raw pointers. We say we want to cast this pointer to the base class to, um, to the dynamic class. Uh, <laughs> yes, it does. But okay, let's see. Illegal token, what are you talking about? Do you guys see what the issue is? Is it not? Okay, maybe it's not there. Definitely it's, huh? Hold on, let me just double check this. This is how often I do this. What am I doing wrong? Maybe it's, no, oh, definitely not in the CD namespace. Did I spell it wrong? Cannot cast base to do. Oh, I'm a, I'm a dummy. In this case, yeah, we do need to specify that it's a pointer type, unlike here, where we assume that it's a shared pointer type already. My bad. All right, so in this case, will this line be called? Well, that's D actually. What will be the output on the console here? Anybody? Don't worry guys, we're really almost done. Anybody? What would be the output? Just tell me, Jeremiah. I don't want to think about it. It's too freaking late. All right. Well, if we look at this, we see that we, in this case, we have a, oh, let's stick with this code here. We have a shared pointer to the base class, which is actually a pointer to a derived object, right? And here we use dynamic pointer cast to convert it from 
a pointer to the base class to a pointer to the derived class. Here it's the exact same thing, except now we're using raw pointers. I just wanted to show you the, um, like basically like the, the same, but then using raw pointers, what would it look like? Because you might actually not ever come across these dynamic casts or static casts. Um, so this is how we would do it. And just to continue the example, if we wanted to go back, we can use static pointer cast on the derived sharp pointer. And same with the raw versions. If we want to cast back, we can use static casting uh, base. And this does not require a dynamic cast because we know at compile time, if it's a pointer of type derived, it can definitely be cast. We don't need dynamic casting at all. This is just a reinterpretation of the pointer types. This, on the other hand, does a runtime check to make sure that this, in fact, does point to an object of type derived. How it does that? Yeah, I've seen it once before. It goes probably through its class hierarchy and looking for uh, using runtime type information to ensure that along its inheritance chain that it does indeed point to an object of that type. And if that check fa uh, fails at some point along the uh, uh, the inheritance chain, then it will return a null pointer. Well, in this case, both the cast will work because we constructed it as a derived type. The dynamic cast from the base type to the derived type, of course, will work because we just know we've done this. But we could have, for example, um, derived two, which also inherits from base, this whatever. Um, and if we actually did this, right, this code will still compile just fine. There's no problem here, right? But now this D, because we're trying to cast a derived and not, and even though it was constructed from derived two, this is what our inheritance hierarchy looks like now. Wait, there's my pen. So we still have base, let's go black. We still have base. And now we have, oh, damn it, that's too small. Derived, which inherits from base. And we have derived two, which also inherits from base. But there is absolutely no relationship at all between these two types. So there's no way for me to convert derived two to derived or the other way around, a derived to derived two. This is not allowed. We can, of course, cast both of them, static cast, we don't even need a dynamic cast, to the base type but we cannot go the other way around without a dynamic cast. Okay, so now if I ask you what will be printed to the console, everyone in unison should say, nothing, sir, nothing will be printed to the console because the dynamic cast will fail. All right, shall we test? So we create a drive two, store that in the base pointer, that's perfectly fine, right? It has a strong reference count, good. D, no, D is empty because a dynamic pointer cast failed because it's not of type derived, it's of type derived too. We're casting the derived back to the base, well, in this case, because that was empty, this will definitely be empty too. Uh, but no worries, it was a shared pointer, so we didn't leak any memory. The object gets destroyed because now we have an invalid pointer, so the original one gets destroyed safely. This, on the other hand, much worse things will happen because now we have a valid object here. You see the pointer address is correct. However, the pointer to the derived type failed, so we actually returned a null object. Now, if we try to take that null pointer and cast it back to a base, it works, but PB becomes null. And now the original pointer that we had in PB is gone forever. No destructor was called, it will not be cleaned up. Now that's no longer valid, so that won't get printed, and this is no longer valid either, because they're indeed not of type derived too. Okay.
And then we should definitely, if we have a raw pointer, always match it with a delete. Um, it's actually safe to delete it through its base pointer. As long as the destructor is virtual like this, then all the resources will be released correctly in case they have been allocated in the drive type. Okay, any questions about that? I'm not really sure what the code does because I joined all, uh, midway through, so the code is kind of weird for me, but the drawing you just made, uh, why why would you ever want that? Why would you ever want the top right thing about base and derived and derived to? Let's why say you, you have um, a UI widget, which might have functions like draw, yeah. which takes maybe the display to draw to as an argument, who knows. Now we have a button or a UI button. Um, and it derives from UI widget. Mm -hmm. And we have a UI slider. Could be. Uh, and it derives from UI widget. Now we have a function that says draw widgets, which takes an array widget, like 500 widgets. We don't know what type they are. We don't know if it's a button. We don't know if it's a slider. But as long as it derives from UI widget, we can draw it, right? Mm -hmm. um, draw. So as long as we know what the base type is, base type, we can call the functions on that regardless of what type it is. So we could have, for example, a radio button, which derives from button because it has different behavior, but most of the functionality is the same as button. But since mm -hmm. through the hierarchy, hierarchy of inheritance, it does, in the end, it's a widget. We know whatever type of widget function. it is, it can draw. Yeah, okay. So when we would have this? A lot of times. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. Think about entities. Mm -hmm. Okay, entities. Like, right, we have... Uh, entity component systems possibly, but okay, that's a different one altogether, but we might have a component, top level component that we want to allow entities to own, right? Entity component system. And we could have like a physics component or a, or whatever, a, a, a renderable component, renderable component, who knows? And they all come from component because component you know, has some virtual functions that we can override in any one of our components. And inside of entity, we can have a huge list of components. Hmm. Well, we don't know what kind they are. As long as they derive from component, we know how we can use them. Yeah. We know we can call certain functions on them because all components will have these functions, whether they're overridden in their derived classes we just know we can call it because it's we know it's a component yeah okay so yeah when do you come across this a lot a lot yeah um i was so that, kind of confused yeah yeah so being able to cast uh upcast and downcast uh, this, this is happening a lot because we might say okay we have a component but i want to check is it a physics component or is it a render component well in order to find that out for sure the only way we can safely do that is by using a dynamic cast. And if we say, is it a physics component? And we do a dynamic cast and it says null, well, then we know it's not a physics component. Might be another component, like a render component, for example, but it's definitely not a physics component. But if the dynamic cast succeeds, then we know that it's somewhere within the inheritance hierarchy of a physics component, and we can safely call functions that are specific to the physics component. Uh, same with the widgets. If we know we have, we want something that derives from button. Well, as long as our dynamic dynamic cast to the button type succeeds, well, we know that it's either a radio button or an actual or a button. If we need to know for specifically if it's a radio button, well, then we can do a dynamic cast to radio button. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we have a pointer to a, hmm? 
that does casting something cost a lot of uh, CPU power or uh, static cast? Frame? No, static yeah. cast is basically just a reinterpretation of the pointer. So there's no runtime cost. Okay. However, the dynamic cast, yes. So you shouldn't do that every frame on dynamic cast. Costing. I would say profile before you make any assumptions about anything. Anything. Okay. Like if you say, oh yes. man, I'm going to dynamic cast this, oh, it's going to kill my frame rate. No, it won't. Don't assume that. Use profiling, or if you see your memory, or sorry, if you frame your frame rate, like you're running it on the target hardware and you see it's not even getting anywhere near your your target frame rate, which would be like, what, 60 on most hardware, I guess. Boy, nowadays you probably want to get to 120. <laughs> if you can't get that, then profile and find out for sure what's going wrong. And if the dynamic casting is the problem, then look for alternatives. But no, never make those assumptions because sometimes there's no other way of doing it. Or there might be, but it's sometimes better to lean on the side of code readability and understandability rather than over-engineering just to save yourself a few CPU cycles, which doesn't mean shit in the end because yeah, it was never a performance bottleneck in the first place all right so don't yeah. over engineer just because you think something is going to be a bad performance always profile okay so this is something that we talked about in the profiling lecture uh early optimization is the source of all things evil you're wasting your time trying to find performance issues which are not there Without proof, you're wasting your time, you're wasting the company's time, and you're wasting your team's time. Okay. Okay? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a few CPU cycles. Will it kill your performance? Probably not. There are definitely a few things that you can do which are super simple. For example, um, iterators are usually pretty fast. Array indexing uh, in debug mode will be slower because there are, uh, in the code, there will be bounce checks. Those can, if you do it a lot, they will be, they might slow your code down a lot. So iterating arrays doesn't have this issue because iterators are inherently already uh, bound safe. Right, so you use um, on a container, for example, an STD container, you use begin and check for the end. Uh, if you just say like int i equals zero, it's a vector, int i equals zero, and you check the length of the vector, and then you use the array index operator on the vector, in debug mode, you're going to see a performance hit. In release, hopefully not, because I guess in release mode, it assumes that you're not, you know, or trying to access the array outside of the bounds of the array. I hope, anyways. But yeah, so these kind of things you can kind of like just know and just code these things these way. But things like dynamic casting, there is a small hit, but please don't make any assumptions about, right, like a shared pointer has a reference counter. Oh, I shouldn't use shared pointers because every time I create a copy of a shared pointer, I have to increment an atomic integer. Oh my God, that's going to kill my performance. No, it's not. I mean, if you use them smart, you shouldn't be passing you know, shared pointers around by value anyways, really. But you can pass them around by reference. There's absolutely zero overhead, additional overhead with passing things by reference. Um, but passing things by value might have a slight overhead, yeah, with, with a ref counter. But it will never be something that will show up on your performance analysis. All right? Yep. So, yeah, the, the, like, the, the goal is to make sure your game runs as well as it can. You set a target frame rate for your, you know, for your game. For a particular hardware, you say, okay, we want it to run at this frame rate on this hardware. You achieve that, you're fine. Anything else is not worth profile or performance uh, optimizing. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Then I congratulate you guys for staying 
all the way to the end. I know high top came in late, but good enough. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, this is kind of, um, I would say it's getting a bit more complex now, right? At the beginning of the year, September, October, <clears throat> we were basically talking about really simple things. We use raw pointers for everything. We use we allow things to exist in global scope for simplicity. Uh, and now we're getting into the kind of the low level, on the Iowa low level, more complex parts of the standard template library. Um, but it's kind of good to to be aware of these things and don't just use them because they're there. Know why you're using them and understand what the implications are. Right? We have some first year students who come into the program and they're just like, Hey, I've got, you know, C11 or 12, 20, 22 on my brain, and I have to use everything that C20 introduces in C23. And nobody can read the code because it doesn't make sense. But if you, you know, and your team also knows, you know, about shared pointers and or whatever the, you know, the random library or the time library of C11, uh, then you, you know, then you should use it if it makes sense to do so. But don't just use it just because it's there. Right? There's something to be said about understanding your code. Yes? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Then um, if there are no further questions, uh, maybe we'll do a check. Uh, what do you guys think is interesting topic to cover next week? That's a very good question. <laughs> I have a um, let's see. I have some some lectures that I have already prepared. I think I won't go through foundational stuff anymore because if you've gotten this far in the in, in the intake, then um, there's probably nothing in the foundations that is interesting anymore. I have a lecture on um, containers, so uh, arrays, uh, maps, sets. A lecture on iterators, the algorithms library, ranges and views, which is a C plus plus twenty twenty subject. Yeah, C plus plus twenty subject. A good and for me, it was very uh, interesting to actually make this lecture on random because there's a lot of different random distributions in the C++, actually got C, introduced in C++ 11, so already 23 years ago, uh, 22 years ago. Uh, wait, what year are we in? <laughs> 2023 minus 11. Yeah, I'm smart, 12 years ago. Uh, but anyway, so a random uh, number generation. Uh, I've got a lecture on the time library in um, C++ 11. So that's the chrono library, chrono namespace. And this one on smart pointers. Didn't, didn't you tell already something about random in the in the intake day at Buos? Very, very low, like minor <laughs> that was like we i think we used one random number generator and that was on the orientation day i think it was right the orientation day yeah yeah so that's kind of interesting so yeah i think we used um a uniform int distribution right that was it sure. but there there's <laughs> way know. way more distributions so we could talk about that if you want there's like Are five or six monday hmm? is it monday when you're, or Wednesday next no, week? No, next week, Wednesday. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this once a week, I think, now. So, okay. Um, I'm just going to do a quick sign-off um, for the video. So that's it for today. Don't forget, uh, there's some additional reading material you can address. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.